Uh, I'm Lori Kirk. I'm a reverse engineer at Microsoft. And I'm going to be talking to you a little about the techniques used if Android obfuscation, mainly used in malware. So first of all, let's go into a little bit of background about what obfuscation is and how it's used in Android malware. Obfuscation is the technique that's based on the code or anything that the application is doing to try and obscure the underlying functionality from within the application. So this is used in many different platforms, for example, Windows executables, Linux ELF binaries or Mac binaries. But this is particularly important in Android applications, APK files. So the reason for this is when developers are creating Android applications, they're developing this in very pretty source code that's in Java or Kotlin languages. So when a reverse engineer is looking at an Android application, they can decompile the code to get almost the original Java source code, which is very easy to use. So the developers will use obfuscation techniques to try and hide their actual functionality. So we talked a little bit about what the background of obfuscation actually is, but let's go into some of the techniques used for obfuscation. First, we have two reasons for obfuscation. The first would be defensive techniques. This is going to be very legitimate techniques that developers will use to try and protect their source code from reverse engineers who are trying to exa uh, examine the code or trying to find any of the underlying sensitive data. Or they might use this for application optimizations or even performance enhancements. So for example, if they're taking the variable method or class names in an application, they might try to reduce the size of those because if you decompile an application, you're actually getting the original developer variable names. So by reducing those sizes, you're actually reducing the overall size of the entire application. Final reasons would be uh, tamper defense or vulnerability hardening. So they're trying to obfuscate the underlying functionality so that if a reverse engineer is taking a look at the code, they won't be able to understand the actual code and how it works. So therefore, they won't be able to develop custom exploits to tamper with the application <coughs> or exploit it. The next motivation for obfuscation is going to be offensive obfuscation. And this is going to be the primary focus of the talk today. So the goal behind this is for malware developers to try and prevent reverse engineers from being able to actually examine their application and understand that it's malicious. So they are trying to avoid antivirus detection as well. Uh, for example, they might use a technique called packing, which I will talk about in a couple slides, in order to try and uh, encrypt and compress malicious code so that you're not able to see this code on disk so that if an antivirus isn't emulating or dynamically running the file, they will falsely classify this as a clean file because they can't actually locate the malicious code. So that ties into the third point of the malware author's goal is to just conceal their malicious code. Finally, they might try to mask the actual origin of the application. A good example of this is they could actually name their a package name within their application to match a legitimate library so that a reverse engineer looking at the code might write this off as, oh, this is legitimate library code that I shouldn't take a closer look at. So now we talked that there are offensive and defensive reasons for Android obfuscation. Let's go into the actual techniques employed to perform this obfuscation. First of all, we have some basic static techniques that you'll be able to see on disk if you're decompiling the application. The one that I talked about previously was renaming identifiers, but instead of just doing this for optimization purposes, they might do this to actually try and rename these to misleading variable names or even create junk variable names to try and obscure when a reverse engineer is trying to examine the application. They might also do junk code insertions. So if they're putting in a lot of additional code, then the reverse engineer might not be able to locate what is the actual code that's going to be running. And due to the asynchronous, asynchronous nature of Android applications, this is particularly effective. Finally, they might perform string or class encryption so that any of, the, any of the sensitive data or any of the malicious code is actually encrypted on disk and forces the reverse engineer to use dynamic analysis techniques. So we talked a little bit about the static techniques. Let, look, let's look at a couple examples here. If you look on the top right hand side, this is an example of a malware author who created a banking Android application. This is a Trojanized application that uses 
uh, identifier renaming. You see here, they took all of their variable names and they renamed them to a meaningless string of characters followed by a meaningless string of numbers. So that when you're taking a look at this, it's very frustrating and you have to go into every single respective method and rename those identifiers yourself if you can identify the underlying functionality. They also used value encryption here. So they, believe it or not, all of these are actually string values, but you cannot tell if you're looking at this on disk. Um, they performed a lot of addition, subtraction, multiplication between the strings to hide those when you're reverse engineering this on disk. So those were some simple static obfuscation techniques. So let's start looking at some dynamic ones. First of all, packing. This is used among many different applications and uh, across many different platforms as well, not just Android. But basically this is taking all of the code of the application and compressing and usually encrypting this on disk and then dynamically loading that code and decrypting it while the application is running or at runtime and loading that into the runtime state. Uh, it's very common for Android malware authors to abuse the application subclasses for this technique. Uh, for some background, the application subclass is part of the Android framework, so developers can inherit their classes from the application class, part of the Android framework, and the reason they'll do this is that this code in this class is actually instantiated first. So this is going to be the first thing that runs when you have an application beginning, so it is commonly used to decrypt additional classes and methods at runtime. So I talked a little bit about what packing is, but there's a lot of confusion related to packing in Android. So I wanted to provide three techniques that I like to use for identifying packing in an Android application. Firstly, there will be a discrepancy between the Android manifest, which is basically a file that defines all of the permissions, components, and classes that can run inside of an Android application. And there will be a discrepancy between those definitions and the actual classes that you see defined on disk. So if you notice that and you can't find the actual definitions of the code, it's a very good indicator that this application is actually packed. Second, you'll see the use of a class loader. Very common ones are dex class loader, path class loader, and in-memory dex class loader, which are actually dynamically loading additional Dolvik executable or Android executable files while the application is running, followed finally by a call to a reflective method. So right here, it would be taking that executable, loading it in, and finally using a reflective call to actually be able to call those methods in the application runtime. So here's an example of an application using packing here. This is a bit of the Android manifest. Remember that defines the permissions and components in an application. You can see on the top right hand side, we have a class defined here. You see that limit system gesture part of the package name. And if you look on the left hand side highlighted, you'll see a package beginning with the word limit. So we can see there's going to be the definition of that code. So we can find that on disk. Now, if you look at the bottom right hand side, this is defining another class or activity in the Android application, beginning with the words carry umbrella frost. However, if you look at the package explorer on the left hand side, you don't see anything beginning with the word carry. So that means you can't find the definition for this. So I would guess here that that application subclass at the top highlighted is going to be decrypting this code. And here's an example of the code loading process after it has been defined in the manifest. You can see they're using a generic call to dex class loader, which is actually loading a dynamic APK or Android application, Android package into the runtime. And then they're following that with the reflective call get method to be able to load a particular method from that dynamically loaded file. Now we talked a little bit about packing. Let's look at some native code. So when developers are writing Android applications, they're going to be developing in Java or Kotlin, but it is actually possible to write in C or C++ as well in Android. We do this by being able to communicate back and forth from Java and C++ via the Java native interface, which you can include into your application code to allow you to go back and forth between managed and native code. Managed code here would be Java or Kotlin languages, and then the native code would be C or C++ code. Now, this native code is actually compiled to run on a particular processor architecture, which means it's going to limit the actual kinds of devices that this code will be able to run on. 
Why is this important in malware analysis for Android? Well, if a malware author wants to limit reverse engineers' ability to run the application, they might remove support for x86-based architectures, since most uh, emulators are going to be running a variant of an x86 architecture. And most real Android devices are actually going to be running ARM. So all they need to do is remove that support, and it greatly limits, greatly limits our dynamic analysis process. This is also effective for anti-analysis and anti-reverse engineering, since native code is particularly challenging to read, since it's actually assembly and not Java. This is an example of a malware author using native code. So you can see on the right-hand side, they're actually declaring a separate method. And this will be defined in that .so file, shared object binary, on the left-hand side. So it's defined in a completely separate file. It's not defined in the dex dolvik executable file. So if the malware author wanted to limit their platforms, all they would need to do is remove those two folders on the left that are supporting x86 and x86-64, and they would effectively limit this application to only be running on ARM-based architectures. Here we have a 64-bit and a 32-bit version of ARM. And this is an example of some actual native C++ code that's going to be compiled to run on a particular processor architecture. You can see we have that generic call again to dex class loader, which was loading an additional Dolvik or Android executable file. And this is taking up multiple lines, as you can see. And it's actually requiring the arguments and the signature of every single method it needs to call. So the signature requires the encoded parameters and return value of the method it's trying to target, which is just a lot harder to read. And to take another glance, you can see that the Java code we looked at before was a nice pretty one-liner to call this method, whereas just calling the constructor to instantiate this is three lines right here. And now finally, let's look at our last dynamic obfuscation technique. This is runtime-based obfuscation. So this actually allows an application to modify its current runtime state while the application is in the process of executing to make different methods execute while it is in its execution process. So what an author can do here is they can insert additional malicious code. But if you're looking at this on disk, it appears like those uh, methods are junk and never called. That's because the application is actually modifying itself while it's in the process of executing. So there are two methods for completing this. The first would be to uh, subvert the code loading process. So that process, the Dolvik executable, or that Android executable file, is going to be mapped into memory. And then that memory mapped dex file is going to be loaded into multiple different runtime objects that basically just store the different code and data related to a particular method in Android. Or you could alternatively do this post-code loading and actually take those runtime objects and modify their pointers or instructions to run completely separate instructions. To look a little closer at these two techniques, the first one was happening during the code loading process, so taking that memory mapped dex file and loading those into different runtime objects you could have two techniques for performing this. The first would be to find the pointer to the memory mapped dex file, and then load an entirely separate dex file into memory as well, and swap those two pointers so you're actually running an entirely separate executable file. The other option, alternatively, would be to edit the code item instructions array. If you follow down the class definition object for those, you can get a pointer to the instructions and actually modify those instructions in place or copy over separate instructions. And finally, you can look at the next technique, which is going to be taking those already loaded and uh, complete runtime objects. And you can find the ART method object, Android runtime method object. So that's one of the methods that's going to be holding all of the methods for a particular Android class. Find the vtable, which basically is a giant data structure pointing to all the different methods associated with a class. And you could swap the pointers of that vtable. Or alternatively, you could take that object, follow all the pointers down to find the instructions array, and replace that like we did in the first option. If you look on the right-hand side there, that is an example of the Android kernel source code. And that is returning a pointer to that vtable, or a specific method in that vtable, that you could then work with to modify. So you might be thinking, well, this sounds like a great technique. Why doesn't everybody do it? 
Primary reasons, it creates really brittle, brittle breakable, complex code. So if you know anything about Android, Android has a lot of different API versions that are available. So basically, you have to perform pointer math to find the entry points or the offsets to different objects for every single different API version. So you'll have a giant if or switch statement inside of your code that just says, is this API version 28, 27? And then you'll calculate those pointers accordingly. So this is an example of somebody hooking the ART method object and trying to do that entry point hooking that we talked about. But this is very complicated to read and even more complicated to write. So that was our last technique for dynamic obfuscation. In conclusion, just to remind you, obfuscation is the process that a developer, either legitimate or malicious, might be trying to conceal their code and try and hide their underlying sensitive data from reverse engineers. The static techniques were identifier renaming, so naming all your variables, methods, or classes separate names, or inserting junk code that isn't actually called, and finally, string or class encryption to hide that sensitive data on disk so that it's only revealed during the execution of the application. And the dynamic techniques were reflection and packing, so that was decrypting and decompressing dynamic code and loading it into the runtime. We also had native code, which was writing part or all of your application in C or C++ code, and then calling that. And then finally, runtime-based obfuscation, where, where an application modifies its own runtime state while it's in the process of executing. So thanks so much, and I hope you all learned a little bit more about obfuscation. <laughs>